News of the Times. Frightful Fridays. The Crumbles Murders. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, we look at one of the two crimes in the famed beauty spot of the Crumbles in Eastbourne. We start this two-part series with the more gruesome crime of the butchering of Emily Kay. In 1924, attractive typist Emily Kay thought she had met her dream man in work colleague Patrick Mahon. Alas, he was anything but. This brutal murder was the cornerstone of changing how crime scenes would be handled in the UK forever. Going to a romantic seaside love cottage to prepare for the planned move to South Africa with her dream man, it would be the last time she was seen alive. We take a look at the second of these two horrific crimes to these two young women in a backdrop of scenic beauty in today's episode of Frightful Fridays. We hope you enjoy the show. The Crumbles The term crumbles in the context of Eastbourne refers to the Eastbourne Crumbles, which is an area of coastal erosion and cliffs along the English Channel in Eastbourne, East Sussex, in England. A geological treasure trove, the Eastbourne location was, and still is, a popular vacation spot featuring a long shingle beach by the sea. Crumble's Murder 2 The second Crumble's Murder in this two-part series, which we are featuring, takes place in 1924 and became famous for its new crime scene methodology in forensic evidence gathering and forensic approach within the UK with the famous pathologist Sir Bernard Spilsbury. This murder was particularly horrific in the brutality inflicted on Emily Kay. Background Patrick Mahon seems to have had it all. Good looks, easy charm, intelligence. Outwardly, he played the part of a regular church attendee and football enthusiast. He married in 1910 his childhood sweetheart, Jessie, and the couple had two children. But this facade of respectability began to show signs of strain in 1910. Mahon, the occasional Sunday school teacher and committed family man, was arrested for burglary of a clergyman. In 1911, Mahon stole £123 from his employers and made an escape to the Isle of Man, effectively dumping his wife for another woman with the money he had stolen. He was caught, but Mahon's charm helped to minimise the consequences legally. Jesse took him back, despite the illicit affair he had carried on, and he moved back in with her. One year later, he stole £60 from his new employer. This time, the officials were less lenient, and Mahon received a prison sentence of one year. Once Mahon had finished his penal servitude, the couple moved to Carn in Wiltshire. Mahon was now continually short of money as he became hooked on gambling. His accumulated debt spiralled. In 1916, Mahon again was caught in the act of burgling a different employer. A servant girl working in the house Mahon was attempting to burgle caught him in the act. Mahon attacked her, hitting her repeatedly with the hammer and asking her where the keys to the safe were as she lost consciousness. The girl recovered enough to be able to identify 
Mahon. This time, Mahon was sentenced to five years' imprisonment. In 1919, Mahon was again released from prison and returned to his long-suffering wife, Jessie. By this time, she was working as a secretary to the firm Consul's Automatic Eratos in Richmond. She managed to secure a position for her husband as a salesman. Investigations into his antecedents would show that Mahon continued to carry on numerous affairs with various women throughout his job as a salesman. It was easy to do with the travelling that his job required. He often used a pseudonym to hide his true identity. In one of his frequented visits to the London office, he met Emily Kay. Emily Kay was a private secretary and shorthand typist working in London, the same office that Patrick Mahon regularly visited in his role as sales manager. Emily, an enthusiastic tennis player at 37, dreamed of married life and family. Flattered by the attention she, she received from charming, handsome Patrick, known as Derek Patterson to her, Emily eagerly joined in an affair. Derek, as she knew Mahon by, had stated he was unmarried. The relationship must have seemed an opportunity to fulfil her dreams of husband and family, despite what would have been considering her advanced years. Emily, within her working life, had some £500 in savings, worth approximately £40,000 in 2023. Always short of money, no doubt the news of her nest egg enticed Mahon to pursue Emily hard, with an aim of extracting her money from her. Emily, with visions of a family and a happily ever after, could not believe her good fortune. Mahon, always with his eye on her fortune, had been promising Emily marriage under the assumed name of Derek Patterson. On holiday in Bournemouth, Mahon presented Emily with a diamond and sapphire ring, proving to Emily that he was sincere and that they would marry and be a family. Mahon had convinced Emily that they should now emigrate to South Africa for their new life together. To add to her dream, Emily, absolutely delighted, discovered she was pregnant. Emily, bubbling over with the news of all her dreams coming true, shared the happy events in letters to her family and friends. The Bungalow In preparation of their move to South Africa, Mahon rented a cottage in the Crumbles in Eastbourne, which would be their love experiment. The cottage was rented under Mahon's new pseudonym, Waller. Gleefully, Emily withdrew the majority of her savings. Emily arrived in Eastbourne on the 8th, staying temporarily at a hotel. She then moved to the rented bungalow on April the 12th, making preparation for the anticipated migration to South Africa. Derek, as Emily knew Mahon, would meet her there in a few days. Friends received letters glowing with supposed details of the forthcoming trip, including a short stay in Paris on the way there. Mahon to arrive later was supposedly working in getting Emily her passport and trying to tie up loose ends. He was to arrive at Eastbourne Railway Station on the 12th or 13th of April to be collected by Emily. Before Mahon embarked on the train to take him to their love nest, Mahon had purchased a chef's knife and hacksaw from an ironmonger next to London Victoria Station. The Crime The crime was a bloodbath. On the 15th, 
Emily had written to her friends expounding on the upcoming move to South Africa. According to Mahon, it was on this day that the death of Emily occurred. In Patrick's version of events, the two had a small spat. Emily allegedly attacked Patrick by throwing an axe at him which grazed his ear. In his defence, Patrick stated the two grappled each other and Emily fell down, hitting her head on the coal scuttle. Not knowing what to do, Patrick covered her body with her fur coat. The next day, Mahon invited a woman he had met to stay with him at the cottage. The woman, Ethel Duncan, spent the weekend with him where they dined expensively and visited the London Palladium. Upon her departure, Mahon severed Emily's head and legs and placed the pieces in a travelling trunk. Over the coming week, the process of dismembering Emily continued. He burnt Emily's feet and legs in the fireplace, as well as her skull, which he then crushed, swept up and discarded. Emily's skull was never recovered, other than some fragments of her jawbone. Mahon continued to sever Emily's arms and the torso into pieces. Some parts of her body were boiled. Other parts were gathered together and thrown out of a railway carriage. The Discovery Jessie, Mahon's long-enduring wife, suspected her husband was continuing to cheat on her. To prove her assumption, she hired a private detective, John Beard, to investigate Patrick, and it would be the beginning of his downfall. Whilst doing her own investigations of her husband, Jessie found a luggage ticket for Waterloo Station. With her hired detective by her side, the pair went to look at the bag that had been left there. Upon opening it, they discovered a knife and bloody clothing. With advice from her investigator, the ticket was quietly returned to Mahon's suit pocket and Scotland Yard were contacted. The Arrest On the 2nd of May, at Waterloo Station, Mahon was arrested while looking to retrieve the bag he had left there. Scotland Yard were waiting for him. At Scotland Yard, the bag was further analysed. Both the knife and the clothing were heavily stained with blood. There was also a tennis racket with Emily's initials on it. Mahon was questioned hard by investigators. His initial responses were vague as he tried to explain away what was clearly linked to a crime. Eventually, Mahon confessed that he had been involved with the death of Emily, but that it was not murder and gave the address of where the death had occurred. From the Sunday Mirror, the 4th of May, 1924. Bungalow of Death. Neighbours on Crumbles. Tell of Bobbed Haired Woman. The detention at Waterloo had its sequel yesterday in sensational investigations carried out by the East Sussex Police at Langley Cottage near Pevensey, on the edge of Eastbourne's desolate crumbles. Near the scene of the murder, 17-year-old Irene Munro in August 1920. The police forced an entry into a building known as the Officer's Bungalow, the largest of eight bungalows which form an L at Langley Point. There, it is stated, they found the dismembered body of a young woman who had been dead nearly a fortnight. A neighbour last night told the Sunday pictorial the story, so far as it is known, of the latest occupants of the officer's bungalow. She said the house was rented about six weeks ago by a youngish man and a pretty bob-haired woman from the owner, Mrs. Hutchinson, who is now believed 
to be in South Africa. Police came in droves to work the horrific crime scene. When Spilsbury arrived at the cottage, he was appalled by the lack of forensic care being taken with the scene of the crime. Detectives were sifting through evidence with their hands and there was no systematic approach to the murder scene. It was this case which Spilsbury played a large part that changed the way detectives approached crime scene documentation and evidence collection. It was from this case that Spilsbury's murder bag, including tweezers, separate bags to place evidence in, plastic gloves and measuring tape, became standard kit given to detectives in future cases. Mahon himself insisted that the death of Emily had been completely accidental and in large part due to self-defence. From the Birmingham Daily Post, the 7th of May, 1924, Crumble's Bungalow Mystery. Remanded man's reply to murder charge. It was not murder. Another stage in connection with the discovery last week of the portions of a woman's body in a bungalow at the Crumbles near Eastbourne was reached yesterday. Patrick Mahon was charged at Hailsham Police Court with the willful murder of Emily Bealby K, 29, at Langley on or about April the 15th. Mahon was detained last Friday calling for a portmanteau at Waterloo Station, London, and was conveyed to Hailsham on Monday. Yesterday morning, Superintendent Sinclair of the Sussex County Police had Mahon brought out of the cells of the Hailsham Police Station and formally charged with murder. The dark-haired woman who has been mentioned in connection with the mystery attended the police station at Hailsham at the initiation of the police and made a statement. It is understood she will attend the inquest today when developments are expected. The police, it is stated, are endeavouring to trace a third woman who is believed to have stayed at the bungalow recently. The woman mentioned were alleged visitors to the Crumbles' cottage, invited by Mahon, whilst Emily's dead body lay under a fur coat. It was never clearly established if they also stayed at the cottage whilst parts of Emily's body had been dismembered. As could be expected, the case of the attractive man, his illicit pregnant girlfriend, who was now found dismembered, and the possibility that he had entertained two other women within the bungalow whilst Emily lay dead under her fur coat, led to a media frenzy. From the Birmingham Daily Post, the 7th of May, 1924, Crumble's Bungalow Mystery, Crowds in Court. Mahon was brought before the magistrates yesterday afternoon. A large crowd had gathered outside, and directly the doors were opened, there was an unseemingly rush on the part of the people who attempt to push their way in. At first, the police at the doors were swept aside, but other officers came in to their assistance, and they were successful in keeping the crowd back. Coats were torn and hats smashed in the melee. Within a few moments, over 200 persons had managed to squeeze into the space normally accommodating between 40 and 50. Among those present were Superintendent Wensley, Chief Inspector Savage and Inspector Hall of Scotland Yard. Mahon's rather thin face twitched as he glanced around the court on entering the dock. He is a tall, good-looking man with brown curly hair, turning grey and blue eyes. His face was unshaven, 
and hair ruffled, he wore a green-striped fawn coat. Superintendent Sinclair stated that the prisoner was received into custody on Monday at Hailsham from Inspector Savage of Scotland Yard. A popular man. Mahon, it is learned, has for the past months lived with his wife and nine-year-old son in Pagoda Avenue, Richmond, in Surrey. Mrs. Mahon is still living in Pagoda Avenue. Their daughter, aged 12, is attending Q School for Girls. Mahon is a prominent figure in Richmond bowling circles and is a member of the Mid-Surrey Bowling Club. He played with other members only last Thursday and seemed then in his usual spirits. A member of the club said on Monday night, he is an exceedingly charming and popular man. Police searches. As already stated, the human remains found in the bungalow were so mutilated portions had been incinerated that the task of identification was rendered extremely difficult. The police yesterday resumed digging operations in the bungalow grounds in the hope of finding the missing head. Every attempt was made to, to be able to confirm that the dismembered woman was indeed Emily Kay, but the finding of the skull continued to elude the police. From the Dundee Evening Telegraph on the 5th of May, 1924, Vanished Girl and the Bungalow Mystery Digging operations and other investigations are being feverishly conducted by the police with a view to throwing further light on the mystery, on the mystery of the dismembered body of a woman found in the officer's house, a bungalow at Pevensey Bay on the Crumbles near Eastbourne. No charge has yet been made against the man who was so dramatically detained in, at a cloakroom at Waterloo Station when he called for a portmanteau deposited earlier in the week. The portmanteau was found to contain blood-stained clothing. The man gives the name of Patrick Mahon and has stated that his wife lives in West London. Inquiries are being made for a Miss Kay, a tall, bobbed-haired girl who lived at a club in Guildford Street in London for a year and left a month ago, telling her clubmates that she was engaged to be married and was going abroad. Her description coincides with that of the girl seen at the bungalow. Further discoveries by the police. Four plain clothes officers who have been making inquiries in London in connection with the case returned to Scotland Yard this afternoon in a taxicab, each of them carrying a strapped and bulging suitcase, one of which bore the letters H H K. The task which confronts the police in what is one of the most astounding of crimes of recent years, is a formidable one. Whoever perpetrated the ghastly murder has sought to destroy all traces of the victim's identity, and at the moment the head of the dismembered trunk cannot be found. It is to be feared that when the head is discovered it will be so mutilated that it will not afford any great clue to the victim's identity. But there is a strong resemblance to the description of the girl seen at the bungalow and the missing Miss Kay. Human Remains The story of the discovery of the human remains is related by Dr. R. M. Leclerc of Pevensey. I was called there on Saturday about 10 a.m. by the Hailsham police, he said, and in company with Chief Inspector Savage and Inspector Hall of Scotland Yard, entered the back room of the bungalow in which was a large trunk containing several parcels. The cover of the first parcel was a woman's 
coat frock. It was wrapped round a mass of flesh and bone, including a hip bone, which had been sawn in two. In another parcel were wrapped other bones from which most of the flesh had been hacked away. Two other parcels contained further bones, and in a four-pound biscuit tin were the heart and other organs, all cut away. Lower down in the trunk we found a woman's fawn coat wrap, a nightdress, a pot of face cream, and two pairs of suede shoes with a quantity of lingerie. I should think death occurred not more than twelve days ago. The woman was, I should think, of average height or a little above. She must have been a broad-chested woman, for the collarbone we found was exceptionally large. Flesh boiled. Two stew pans in the kitchen contained parts of the body which had been boiled, and in the grate were a number of charred bones. We noticed a three-legged coal scuttle, two of the legs which were bent and smeared with blood. It is quite possible the skull had been burned. The dismemberment must have occupied a man for at least two days. Sir Bernard Spilsbury spent hours in examining of the remains, and later had a long consultation with Chief Superintendent Wensley, Scotland Yard. Dr. Spilsbury accompanied the police officers in charge of the case today, who again visited the bungalow to continue his investigations. Digging operations were resumed in the garden, the back of the building, which is surrounded by an eight-foot wall. The Detained Man The man detained, whose name is given as Patrick Mahon, has not yet been charged. He was taken from Cannon Row Police Office in Scotland Yard, where he was interrogated. Patrick Mahon is about 5 foot 9 to 10 inches in height, biggish in appearance, clean-shaven, and was wearing a smart bowler hat and plum-coloured overcoat. Police and medical evidence at present all tend to confirm that the body of only one woman is involved in the affair. Dr. Spilsbury had had a most difficult task in assembling the remains situated about the bungalow. For this purpose, a number of tins were requisitioned from the occupants of the neighbouring bungalows. One experienced officer engaged in the investigation stated it was one of the most horrible cases he had ever come in contact with. The head of the victim had completely disappeared, and in spite of the exhaustive search, no traces of it can be found. The occupants who had taken the bungalow next door to the officer's house for a long period have been so startled at this crime that they have made arrangements to leave today. Missing Girl's Engagement When the Miss K who resembles the woman at Pevensey left the Green Cross Club hostel, she told the secretary and housekeeper that she was going to Cape Town to be married. It was about the end of March, I think, the first Saturday of the tennis season, said a clubmate of Miss K, that I first heard of her approaching marriage. She came bounding into my room, threw her racket on the bed and exclaimed, It's fixed, my dear. I asked what she was referring to, and looked radiantly happy, she pointed to an engagement ring and replied, The date. I pleaded with her to confide the date to me, but putting her finger to her lips, she said with a laugh, Ah, wait and see. I'm leaving here next week. Prolific Letter Writer Other members of the club who reside on the premises stated that Miss K never talked about her affairs or her work. Games, particularly tennis, was the only subject about which 
she ever spoke in the common room. She seldom was out after nine o'clock at night, spending most of the evenings reading novels. She was an extraordinarily prolific letter writer, said one of her chums, and we teased her that most of her salary must have been spent on postage stamps. Miss K lived at the club for 11 months, but during that time never divulged the name of or any other information concerning her fiancé, who never called on her at the hostel. While the police are satisfied that only one girl had been murdered, it would appear that two different girls have been seen. Clubmate's story of engagement ring and intended marriage. The view is held by the experts that the mutilations were carried out within two days of death and that the woman died about ten days ago. Scotland Yard is endeavouring to discover whether there is any connection between Eastbourne and Wimbledon Common discoveries. It may be recalled that on Wimbledon Common on Good Friday, a portion of a woman's leg was discovered. It may turn out that these two mysteries relate to only one crime. The discovery of the crime followed the detention of a man at Waterloo Station in London, called for a long carpet bag which had been left in a cloakroom, and which the attention of the police had been drawn owing to the offensive smell which came from it. Investigations of the bag was found to contain a quantity of women's underclothing and a butcher's knife. With time, it would transpire that Mahon had attempted to dump various body parts wherever he could, including one package of body parts that were thrown from a train window on his way back home. The trial. The trial was heavily based on the forensic evidence produced by Spilsbury. Although there was no question that Mahon had been involved in the death of Emily, the crux of the trial was whether her death had been accidental or premeditated and purposeful. Mahon, trusting in his charm and good lucks, insisted that it had all been an accident. Actually, the dismemberment, which had taken place over a week, had been a panicked response to the death of Emily, he claimed. In one of his claims, he stated that she had attacked him and he had defended himself. In that process, he alleged that Emily had fallen and hit her head on the coal scuttle, a cheap, easily bendable coal scuttle. Billsbury proved that there was no damage whatsoever to the coal scuttle which would have occurred if Emily's head had struck it. He went on to prove forensically that Mahon's purchased meat saw and knife were a match to the cuts on Emily's pregnant body. It was a triumph for the emergence of forensics in criminal prosecutions within the UK. From Reynolds' paper, the 13th of July, 1924, Mahon was arrested on the 2nd of May at Waterloo, where he was taking a bag from a cloakroom. In the bag were found a number of blood-stained articles and Cook's knife. When arrested, Mahon said the judge made a long statement as to how he became acquainted with the woman. Mahon stated, We quarrelled over certain things, and in a violent temper she threw an axe at me. It hit me a glancing blow. During our struggle we overturned a chair and her head fell on an iron coal scuttle, and it appeared to stun her. This happened at about twelve midnight. I attempted to revive her, but found she was dead. Mahon testified on his own behalf for over five hours, insisting on his version of events. 
Points which worked against his version of events included the pre-purchase of the knife and the hacksaw and his rental of the accommodation under an assumed name. Mahon had also attempted to convince the court that the affair with Emily had not been his idea. It was Emily who had insisted that they embark up upon an affair together. Mahon had made changes from his original statement to later statements and statements in court regarding the date of Emily's death. These discrepancies in his testimony were highlighted in court, despite Mahomes' charm offensive. From Spilsbury's evidence, it was proven that deceased Emily Kay had died a day earlier than had appeared in Mahon's first statement. The jury were not taken in by Mahon's charm and found him guilty in under an hour. Appeal The expected appeal was filed under the pretense of misdirection by trial judge Avery. The appeal was summarily rejected. Mahon was convicted and executed at Wandsworth Prison on the 3rd of September 1924, protesting his innocence until the last. From the Illustrated Police News, 11th of September 1924, the execution of Mahon. Patrick Herbert Mahon, the handsome man of commerce, who killed and dismembered Emily Beale Bicay, the typist, in their seaside bungalow at the Crumbles at Eastbourne, has been executed. Mahon walked to the scaffold with firm tread and uplifted head and met his death stoically. He did not utter a single word from the time of leaving his cell until the end. His executioners were Pierpont and Willis, and the whole proceedings lasted less than one minute. There was pallor in his face produced doubtlessly by his long incarceration, but he betrayed none of the expressions seen when he resented certain evidence given against him at his trial. As he neared the scaffold, he threw back his head in an effort of complete self-control. It was one of the swiftest executions in the history of the prison. At 9.20, the notice intimating that the sentence of death had been carried out was posted on the blackboard, affixed the gates at Wandsworth Prison. Outside were over 1,000 people, including a considerable proportion of women and girls. The knife and saw bought and used by Mahon to dismember the body of his victim are to be placed in the Black Museum of Scotland Yard, where a number of relics used by other prisoners are kept. That concludes this episode of Frightful Fridays, The Crumbles Murder 2, Butcher Patrick Mahon. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. Catch up with our next Frightful Fridays episode when we look at the first Crumbles murder of 1920. If you did enjoy the show, please subscribe. Our goal is 1,000 subscribers, and with the fantastic support of our wonderful News of the Times community, we are making great progress towards that goal. We upload four days a week. Saturdays are Serial Killer Saturdays, where we do an in-depth look at a serial killer from our extensive database. The time spans of these ranges from as early as the mid-16th century to the 21st century and encompasses men, women, children and couples who kill. Mondays are murderous, where we investigate in-depth a historical murder. Wednesdays are wicked, where we pull together stories of a similar theme, such as stories of murders by starvation. 
And Fridays are frightful, with stories that are grouped by geographic location, allowing us to share lesser-known grisly crime stories. From all of us at the News of the Times team, thank you again for watching or listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.